to the interest that the private sector is getting from investors from other countries. In particular, I'm referring to the Taiwanese and to the Chinese. Taiwanese because if you talk about manufacturing capacity in the U.S., they basically rely on Taiwan, both for R&D uh, and also for manufacturing. Basically, the U.S. just uh, attach their grants to the products, but it's the Taiwanese, South Koreans, and the Japanese who do the manufacturing for them. We are also getting a lot of investments from China, but Chinese investments have been more focused more on the upstream industries, in particular on steel, and in, there is interest also in uh, petroleum. Now, the flip side of the good investment performance or good export performance of the Philippines is that there are also countries that are enjoying much, much more success, success at this point when you talk about being able to exploit the opportunities opened up by the uh, US-China trade war, in particular Vietnam. Just look at the increasing exports coming from Vietnam to the US. It's about 38%, close to 40%. Taiwan is next with about 20, 25% growth in exports to the US. Uh, South Korea, France, India. So this would also show you if we are to target investments from other countries or we are, we are to benchmark Philippines against other countries on how we can do better in order to take advantage of the opportunities in the U.S. China trade war. These are the very countries that we should be benchmarking against or attracting to invest in the Philippines. With that as a context, what do we need now to do in order to take advantage more of, of the opportunities in the U.S.-China trade war? The President, the uh, presentation and recommendation by the Secretary, the President and the Cabinet approved the last tax trade strategy. Last tax trade strategy uh, rests on two pillars. One important pillar is ensuring that the Philippines remains part and that we sustain our seamless integration in the regional value chain, in particular in ASEAN and in Asia. Uh, we have to ensure that our companies, the businesses in the Philippines, can bring in and bring out raw materials, components that are part of the regional value chain. And also to be able to set up preferential rates to the countries in that, within the regional value chain. But an important question then arises, how about the countries or partner economies that are not part of the regional value chain? For us, we believe the final value adding will favor those countries that have the best access to countries that are not part of this regional value chain. So in particular, if the Philippines can say that we have the best access to U.S. and to, the, to, to Europe, then we can say that we have a good chance of capturing the last touch the assembly for products that are going out of our regional value chain network. And that is our, that is essentially the two pillars of the last touch strategy. In particular, for the U.S., we currently now enjoy uh, GSP privileges with the U.S. such that taken together the GSP uh, product list of the U.S. along with the products with which the U.S. already has MFN 0% duty, Together, these two product categories already allow Philippine exporters about 75% to 80% of what we export to the U.S. already enter the U.S. market at 0% duty. Now, for the EU, we currently have the EU GSP Plus. So we all know that two-thirds of the EU is about 9,000 tariff lines is being exported from the Philippines to the EU already enter the EU market at 0% duty. We are the only country in ASEAN that has this privilege. And then we also have an FDA with ETA member countries, as well as we are undertaking our JDCs, as was mentioned by earlier by Secretary Moon, with 30 other countries. So I'll skip these. So just to summarize, with our FDA network, through the ASEAN and our bilateral FDA with Japan and the EFTA countries, we already cover, we already provide preferential access to about 93% of 
of Philippine exports. So FTA plus GSP, those two combined already give 93% of our exports preferential access. But the problem is that when you talk about GSP, we need to meet the 0% uh, duty access to the US and to the EU permanent. There is a natural graduation process that is triggered when we breach the threshold level. That threshold level is when we become a higher middle income uh, economy. Right now, our GDP per capita is about uh, already more than $3,000. Once we reach $4,000 for three consecutive years, we will be graduating from the EU GSP plus. So if we, for, for instance, say that we can reach the $4,000 per capita mark in about three or four years, then we do that consecutively for three years, then that gives us with six to seven years of being in the EU GSP plus program. That is why we need to also already talk about uh, issuing the FTA negotiations with respect to the EU. I'll skip some of these slides, but we can uh, share this with you. So this is just a summary as what was presented earlier by Secretary Ron Lopez. FTA partners, we cover already 63% of our exports, include GSP and GSP Plus, that's additional 29%. So FTA plus GSP countries, we already cover, would already cover 92% of our exports. Now, what else do we need to do? Okay, with respect to the US-China thing, or as we implement the last touch strategy. What has been done so far is that we've been actively engaging US and China, both of them. We know that we're a very small country to influence U.S. and China relationship with respect to each of them. But with respect to Philippines, U.S., Philippines, China, then we can really make a difference. So we are actively engaging both at the same time. We are also promoting the Philippines as an alternative base for manufacturing companies that are seeking a refuge out of the U.S.-China trade war. And very important, as was mentioned earlier by Sekmon, we are strengthening the use of legitimate trade measures to guard against unfair trade practices or import surges. It is very important because as, as, as countries are shut off from a big market owing to the results of the U.S.-China trade war, they will be looking for other countries, other markets. And the Philippines, because we are growing at 6 to 7%, uh, annually for our GDP, we present a good market for these countries. We present a likely market that hopefully they would uh, trade uh, fairly, but uh, for, for some instances we are seeing that there are cases whereby they are doing it unfairly, meaning dump and subsidize uh, uh, exports to countries within our region. Uh, this is just to show you our track record. We have been very timid when it comes to legit, the use of legitimate trade measures. For instance, in anti-dumping, Philippines for the past, uh, say from 2010 to 2017, we have only used anti-dumping uh, measures twice. Compared with Indonesia 28, Malaysia 23, Thailand 28, and Vietnam 7. If you talk, talk about safeguard measures, Indonesia has been using trade uh, uh, safeguard measures for 14 times over the past seven years. Now, what else needs to be done? Very important, we need to pass the, this may not be popular uh, among some of us, but we need to really remove investor a certain uncertainty because of the non-passage of the corporate income tax and incentives rationalization deal or the Sitira loan. This used to be known before as the Trabah Plain 2, then evolved into the Trabah Bill, and then became the Sitira. The Secretary has been in discussion with the Department of Finance to find a good package for the locators that are currently enjoying incentives that may be in a bit, uh, that may be curtailed in a way 
by the CDA. We are looking for a very good transition mechanism and transition period for uh, current potatoes, in particularly in peso zones. Now, very important, the other major issue that we need to address with our integrated trade and industry policy is to address the trade deficit. Just to provide some numerical perspective on the trade deficit. And many of you have heard me say this so many times I've uh, started to sound like a broken type word. But nevertheless, in 2010, our trade deficit stood at only about $7 billion. By 2018, our trade deficit has ballooned to $47 billion or a deterioration of $40 billion. Of course, products that contribute to the trade deficit per se would be petroleum or even rice, cereal, and imports of the Philippines. But this has been quite stable. If you look at the deterioration, that deterioration of $40 billion could be accounted for by about five product groups. Number one would be automobile. Number two would be electronics, machinery, and equipment. But these are components that go into uh, export products of the Philippines anyway, so it's not really a major cause of concern. So, number one, automobile. Number two, iron and steel and iron and steel products. Number three, petrochem and plastic products. And number four, cement and other construction materials. Which is why if you talk about integrating trade and industry policy, there has to be a focus on these uh, upstream industries. Now, let's take the case of passenger cars. Total imports of passenger cars in 2006 stood at only $430 million. Now, this increased by more than 10 times by 2018. In fact, if you look at our imports of cars from Thailand and Indonesia, our imports from those two fellow ASEAN member countries alone would account for 25% of the deterioration in our trade deficit. 25% of the 40 billion pairs of deterioration in only, is only caused by imports of automobiles from Thailand and from Indonesia. In terms of countries, our trade deficit originates from China. But the good thing about China is that you also have Hong Kong with which we, or with whom we enjoy a surplus of about $6.3 billion. So take it together, China and Hong Kong will be manageable. Our trade deficit would really be with Korea, Indonesia, and then with Thailand. Which is also the reason why we are embarking, as was mentioned earlier by the Secretary, on an FDA negotiation with Korea. We cannot export our way out of the trade deficit because the origin is not about not being able to export, but the cause of the trade deficit is the lack of industrial capacity to service the growing demand in the Philippines because of our robust growth of GDP. So we really have to industrialize our way out of this trade deficit. And as I mentioned, we have to focus on those four product categories that we have mentioned earlier. With respect to this, these are auto steel, petrochemical, and petroleum, and cement and construction related materials. On automotive, we already have the CARS program. We, the Secretary has already transmitted to the Office of the President the executive order for the ECO PUP program or the modernization of the jeepney, the manufacturing side of it. We are also crafting an electric vehicle bill. We are also in the midst of revising the motor vehicle development program. And from the trade side, you would know, you might have uh, read in the newspapers that the Department of Trade and Industry through the Bureau of Import Services has, has accepted a filing for safeguard duty investigation by, the, by, by a labor union in the auto industry. And that you may have also heard, uh, you may have also read in the newspapers that the DDI 
is contemplating or retaliating against a partner country that has been disregarding a WTO ruling that the Philippines has won way back in 2012. This partner country has been appealing this positive ruling that we got, that the Philippines got for already three times. So I think when the Secretary mentioned earlier as one of the core principles that the Philippines follows trade rules, we, we respect our international commitments, but we also expect our partners to do the same. When he was mentioning and that he said that for some cases there will be no other request for the Philippines but to retaliate. And most likely it will be on the automotive sector also, coming from one of those countries from which we are importing heavy uh, automobiles. For the steel industry, we're very happy that uh, Secretary Adrian Cristobal is with us now. Uh, investments on the steel industry has been growing, both from uh, local companies and also local companies in joint venture with uh, uh, foreign companies. In particular, we're very excited about uh, some pioneer projects that the uh, Filipino company has invested in that will ultimately allow the Philippines to produce a simple in, in construction related product such as your household name, Paco, or even the clothes line, yung alambre, or even your paper clip. Because right now, we do not have the wire rods that we need to be able to produce these downstream products. But with the investment from Steel Asia, uh, we will be able to produce the wire rods that we will need to produce Paco paper clip, stapler, and alambre. So that's how important and how critical that we really engage in the development of this industry. For Petra Chemical, we have been able to register in the world of investments two pioneer projects. One was with by JG Sun and the other one was by uh, investment by Petron. So for instance, the investment by JT Summit will finally be able to allow Philippine companies in the auto parts sector to produce rubberized plastics for bumpers of vehicles. For the cement industry, the Secretary has already mentioned that the range of initiatives of the DTI with respect to safeguarding consumer welfare, ensuring that everyone follow standards to the incentives as being part of the investment priorities plan of the BOI to the uh, safeguard measures has seen that players are invested in the country or in the cement industry in new and modern cement facilities with a capacity of about 20 million tons compared with our current capacity of 27, 27 million tons this indeed is substantial. But more important to note is that this 20 million ton capacity would be modern cement facilities that are more energy efficient and that would compete with the inputs that are coming in terms of cost from our neighboring countries. There are many other industries that are more export-oriented rather than domestically-oriented. This would, for instance, just to cite a few, in the aerospace industry, I'm sure you've also heard me say already that the Philippines hosts a major facility of the third biggest aerospace com uh, company globally. This is Rockwell Collins. They are based in Batangas. They employ, employ about two 2,100 workers, but what is fascinating about Rockwell Collins is that of the 2,100 workers that they employ, about 800 are engineers. And of those 800 engineers, 350 are design engineers. 
design engineers that are mostly graduates from a small university in Batangas called Batangas State University. So with the close collaboration between the company, the DTI, and the university, they are able to fulfill or they are able to recruit highly qualified young engineers to be part of uh, the Collins Aerospace Company. With a pending merger between Collins Aerospace and Radeon, another US-based company, they are poised to become the second biggest aerospace company globally. So that would be Boeing, Radeon, slash Collins Aerospace, and then Airbus. So they have a major facility in the Philippines in Batangas. So these are just examples, but very important for us would be to ensure that we remain seamlessly part of the regional value chain because the products and components that Collins Aerospace produces go into airplanes that gets produced somewhere else and not in the Philippines. Another important uh, industry that we're promoting now for the exports would be the electronics and appliance industry. Just to say a bit about Dyson and to illustrate the close connection between industry and trade policy. Uh, Dyson came to us way back in 2012 and they were asking us, would the Philippines be applying for the GSP plus program of the EU? Because at that time, their production facility was in Malaysia. They still do have some production lines in Malaysia. But Malaysia has since graduated from the GSP program because it has already attained a way beyond the higher middle income status. So they are looking at a country with which they could base their manufacturing facilities and that would have good access by way of GSP to Europe. That's why they went to the Philippines and they set up shop here in 2014. And has since then been expanding their manufacturing operations. But what is also fascinating about Dyson is that from manufacturing, they are now moving. They have gone into product design, and now our discussions with them is in terms of setting up their R&D center in the Philippines. Um, they will be setting up an R&D center and will be employing 500 engineers, and the announcement will be any time between now and January. So you could really see that the Philippines is moving up the value chain and covering even high value service um, activities. Uh, so hopefully with those examples we are able to provide to you an illustration of how we are linking trade and industry policy, primarily by way of the last touch strategy that has been approved by the President and the Cabinet. So we look forward to your inputs as we aim to further strengthen and to further calibrate and have a more focused state and industry strategy. So thank you very much. Getting off. 
very, very easy one. Okay, I just wanted to, to welcome Senator I, Senator Heidi Marcos. Welcome, Senator. Thank you very much for for coming. Uh, we, we, we're running uh, slightly over, over time. I mean, our, our apologies for that, but I hope you enjoy what you what you heard from from the Secretary of Law. Yeah, I just I just wanted to to, to recap. I, I was intrigued that that there are many elements to this strategy. So, so let, let let me recap that. So, um, uh, uh, in, inclusive innovation industrial strategy. I think that's critical. And, and the last part I heard uh, was, was something that is, is music to my ears because one thing that really concerns me in, in, in this in this day and age is is automation. A, a lot of what we hear about is, is this IR 4.0 you know? and, and, and what the impact of automation will be on jobs. And that is ultimately what we're trying to do. And so that R and D is I think absolutely important. Because you know we in, in the old days we had these factories that would produce a lot of jobs and we just don't know what the impact will be on the jobs. So that kind of R and D facility I think is absolutely important. And we know that's what we're good at research, we're, we're good at that part of it. That if you remember the old value chain, you know, there, there were the two parts, the consumer facing, the market end, the ad end, that, that was that part, and then the R&D part, and then this is the lower part. Do you remember that? And that's where we haven't really had that. That's great. Can you talk a little bit more about that Dyson? Maybe that Dyson, that tool, takes a license that we, you know, in DPI, you have a, and there's a Italian that is in charge of innovation and that is using Italian language. And there's an other secretary that is in charge of trust and investments. And that would be that would be me. Because uh, taken together we have industry not 4.0 but uh, some of our colleagues here would have heard me say this already, the industry for factorial. With the population level of the Philippines, we need to provide employment to a big number of uh, people. It's not the same as the case of, let's say, Singapore, where you have only a small number of population that can be highly educated. But in here, you have to have a range of jobs available for everyone, from the high school graduates to the college graduates, from those transitioning from agriculture to industry, which is why we need to provide all of these employment uh, opportunities from the more Jurassic industries all the way to the industry 4.0 type of uh, employment opportunities. But with respect to, just quickly with respect to Dyson, so they will, they have, we have already undertaken discussions for the r and center and are helping them uh, find a good location. Uh, but very important is that they are also looking at where the Satira Bill would land. Meaning, what type of incentives that they can get from the Sutira that would allow them to really make the Philippines as their R&D hub for the world. Because Sutira allows the president to offer much more flexible incentives. Right now, even to the extent as what Vietnam has been giving to its investors. Right now, we have very, shall we say, decaho very limited set of incentives that even the president will not offer flexible incentives for highly desirable strategic sectors or projects. We have a, a question of the head. <clears throat> Not only you, not Jager, but our other two facts. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Secretary um, Lopez and the Secretary Rodolfo for a fantastic presentation. Actually, listening to both of the presentations, there's little much that I want to ask, except it reminds me of certain things. Um, one is that I am reminded of the, the, the thrust, of the strategy then, under uh, Secretary Paterno, the time of President Marcos, when they came up with the 10 basic industries. Each of the 10 basic industries would enable us to manufacture a car, or even a point in chemical industry on the line. So I would like to see that we go back to that so we can manufacture not only a paco, but also a bolt or something more uh, upstream. 
That's point number one. Uh, the second point is that we would like to see our industry go into manufacturing hardware and software of industries that will connect our islands. Meaning, number one, the aerospace industry for short haul aircraft, not the big airplanes, which means the best airports, the best short haul aircrafts. Number two, short haul ships and sea crafts. The best seaports, the best ships, again, to connect our islands. And third would be IT. The best IT, again, to connect our islands. The third is how do we come up with a system within what has been done today can continue as a policy and strategy regardless of who gets elected the next president. We have to form this force, this body, but then we have a vision in 2040, 2060 that the next government will not change. So on the first point, uh, well, the difficulty now with respect to the industrial policies that we really have to do it in the context of a liberalized uh, market. Meaning, before we used to have the luxury of looking at protection, but this is also why it's very important that we embark a, a more coordinated effort at industry development, which is why as we have seen earlier in the presentation of second with respect to the cement industry, it has to be a whole of government effort that will be employing from consumer, uh, from standards to incentives, all the way to trade policy. For some industries, they may need uh, some focused targeted developmental programs. And the Secretary has already presented this to the cabinet. The possibility of offering uh, not just subs uh, by, by way of focus programs similar to our CARS program for certain industries. So the so that's one side. We are undertaking industry policy in a liberalized market, so contestable markets. But the flip side also, the good thing about this is that the Philippines is no longer a small economy. We are an economy of 110 million people that is growing at 6 to 7 percent annually. So we can have economies of scale and we should take advantage of that. As we have been seeing, there is demand, there is a question of do we continue to import or do we choose to undertake a delivery industry policy that would allow us to produce most of what we are, or big part of what we are, uh, important right now. I have a written question here. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll paraphrase this question. But what it says is compared to other countries in ASEAN, we don't have that many um, FDA partners. So which, uh, which should be the priorities in the short to medium run? I want to add to this uh, question, uh, Perry. You know, how does this trade war, this U.S.-China trade war, change that dynamic? You know, we we, we talk about a lot of countries. You know, we we have things on the back burner, but is there a sense of urgency now? Do we have to move very quickly to to make sure that we aren't left out of this? Or not? Does it change something? Is there is there really a, a, something very urgent that has to get done? Because we're at risk, is there a risk that if we don't do something, we, we, our economy is at risk? Is, is there something like that that we have to be careful about? Uh, first, in terms of priorities, the number one in our priorities is the U.S. In the U.S. and the EU. Because these are the two big countries that currently we are enjoying good market access because of GSP. But rather than just the U.S. China trade it works really our valuation on the GSP program that uh, worries us. We need to make permanent already our market access to these two big markets. So that's one. Second, with respect to the U.S.-China trade war, we see opportunities with the U.S.-China trade war in the short to medium term. But of course, in the long term, as the trade war drags economic, global economic growth, uh, in the long term, it will also drag down the economy.
rules of origin with respect to EFTA. With respect to the EU, we have to work on the rules of origin. Uh, yeah. <coughs> I'll that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's been a great session. I would like to ask you all to join me in thanking uh, the Secretary uh, Mary Rodolfo in the, in the usual way. Let me uh, turn over to Assistant Secretary Claire well, to close the session. So thank you very much, Under Secretary Rodolfo. Um, a lot of insights from his presentations taken together with the presentation, of course, of Secretary Lopez earlier. So when we now go to session two, we have all done away with our coffee break and have a snack served, but you can go out for coffee and tea. It's just right outside the ballroom. Um, we will now continue with our session on rising global protectionism, trade policies, um, and how they're affected by this. So may I call us again on stage, Mr. Edward Rosa, to continue with the second session. Rising global protection and reflections on, on trade policies. I'd, I'd like to immediately ask the, the, uh, the panelists for, for session two. Um, the Honorable Senator Amy Marcos, the chairperson of the Committee on Economic Affairs, to, to join me on the, on, on the stage. Uh, former Secretary uh, Greg Domingo and Ambassador Ron um, uh, Sorini, and um, Mr. Leandro de Viste, president of Solar Philippines. Is he here? I don't know. Is he here? Um, please, um, please give him a warm round of applause. I wanted to, uh, as, 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 our, as our panelists um, come up, I, I just wanted to, I, to sort of save a little bit of, of, of time by beginning with some. Innovation, 
and you. So it's a great fit for the three eyes policy of the of the DTI. She was a three-term um, congresswoman, authoring and co-authoring bills with a focus on women, overseas Filipino workers, and the youth sector. And one thing I think that was I think, particularly um, interesting was was finding ways to link agricultural producers in her province to urban markets in, in, in I think it was Kessel City. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, to speak about legislative reforms towards competitiveness in the era of globalization, please welcome Senator Heidi Marcus. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Pedrosa. And of course, we have the honor of uh, having present today two DPI secretaries, Madam Greg Domingo and our present secretary, Abunel Lopez. Um, we also have our excellencies um, from Australia, Vita from Austria, Jose from Hungary, um, representatives of the US, the EC, and Taiwan. Um, Chair Cristobal, apparently now in his uh, private permutation. Apo Yulo, of course. Uh, the DTI family, other friends, and uh, those who are here this morning from the business sector. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm not quite the right committee chairman. Um, I head the Committee on Economic Affairs, which assumes that um, we should deal with foreign investment, um, pesas, and incentives, and so on. The uh, trade committee is led by Senator Coco Pimentel, who I assume will be coming at some point today. In any case, uh, we've been kept very, very busy in as much as uh, President Duterte has uh, stated repeatedly that among his priority and urgent measures are measures to do with generating um, foreign investment. And uh, the so-called FIA, or Foreign Investment Act, has fallen to uh, my uh, to my committee. And already in the lower house in Congress, uh, it has passed as a uh, bill. So uh, the Senate now seeks to look at it. Given that um, the uh, Philippines has um, had a fairly dismal record in foreign investment generation. While the burgeoning Asian economies, especially within Barangay ASEAN, go from strength to strength, Asia accounting for 34% of FDIs and ASEAN 20%, the Philippines languishes as one of the four, as one of foreign capital's least attractive and smallest destinations. Singapore today receives over half of ASEAN's investment. Indonesia, following a high-profile anti-corruption campaign, saw a five-fold increase within one year alone from 2016 to 2017. And Vietnam, with its aggressive export policy, was the country of choice for almost all of those 33 companies that departed China almost overnight following the U.S. trade crisis. But 28 years after the passage of our own law, the Foreign Investments Act, foreign capital has only slowly trickled to the Philippines. And unlike our Asian neighbors, we have not been swept up by the great tide of foreign capital that has created global enterprise in ASEAN, empowered agriculture in the countryside, and lifted millions out of poverty and ignorance. Worse, as small as the Philippine share has been in FDI, according to the Banco Central, FDI inflow has even declined by 85% from last year. Further, uh, inter-regional and cross-border ASEAN investment has been almost negligible in the Philippines, when in fact ASEAN community placements have uh, registered a uh, huge amount in both Indonesia and Thailand. So the question arises, what's wrong with the Philippines? And why is everyone, including our neighbors, afraid to invest in us? There's also the challenge of attracting investors that we really, truly want. Those that we need 
responsible and select investors that direct their capital, talented management, and multinational efforts into sustainable developmental enterprises in infrastructure, agriculture, health, tourism, and technology, the sectors that we direly need to develop. Yet what little foreign investment the Philippines has received has merely been in old gas and natural resource projects, traditional manufacture, real estate, wholesale and retail trade. In truth, few new businesses have entered the country, with approved foreign investment pledges in fact declining in the last 18 months. Despite a vaunted domestic market of 110 million people, second only to Indonesia that has leveraged their size so effectively, and an underutilized youth dividend comparable to the rest of Asia, the investments we directly need in the regions or in the provinces that we need, such as Mindanao, seem not to be forthcoming. Are we Filipinos really only good for Pogo and online gaming, at best for call centers, basic customer service, and BPO? So in the effort to derive our share of foreign investments, I have filed together with the rest, and we are now at the committee report level, a new foreign investment act. Because the old law, which aimed to attract productive investments from foreigners, instead set up substantial barriers to trade. The OECD has repeatedly declared the Philippines due to both the Constitution as well as the notorious negative list, continues to be one of the most restrictive countries in the world. The World Bank also decries the minimum 200,000 US dollars um, capital that we impose, substantially bigger than many of our neighbors and the other emerging economies such as China and India. The uh, committee report or the bill at present seeks to reduce this requirement to 100,000 US dollars with just 15, 1, 5, and not 5, 0 direct local employees. The DTI, as well as the different local chambers, support this reduction, stating that only the, uh, the threshold of 100,000 US would uh, only impact 11% of our economy and would instead encourage competition, innovation in the uh, critical areas of uh, digital and creative, tourism, and further technology. Our other amendments also uh, include the uh, rapid and radical changes in the professional marketplace. We uh, invoke the establishment of an investment database with a one-stop brick and mortar throughout the country, um, expanding the uh, information services throughout the country. We hope that um, a new investment promotion council will be able to integrate the divergent and sometimes conflicting efforts of the BOI, PESA, Clark, Subic, CESA, the DOE, PNOC, and other national agencies, as well as LGUs like Ilocos Norte, who sought with a good intention of promoting foreign investment, frequently confusing and discouraging foreigners uninitiated into what is known as the Filipino mess of doing business. We further see the need to rationalize different investment directions into a coherent, comprehensive, and strategic investment priorities plan. The question has arisen time and time again, why are we reducing, even if the OF says they are merely rationalizing tax incentives for locators in uh, economic zones, when at the same time, we are crying for more investment. Indeed, we have to align these efforts and bring them together. Today, the uh, Philippine Investments Priorities Plan is a mere seven-page laundry list. We seek a more coherent and uh, um, comprehensive, as well as integrated plan, uh, similar to those of our neighbors, including, as it were, training and other inputs that would facilitate and expedite such a plan. 
Last year, President Duterte issued the uh, EO65, the 11th negative list. And while we were looking forward to uh, many great changes, even Secretary Perkins says that merely marginal improvements were contained. But for the first time, it posits the liberalization of foreign ownership in internet businesses. Um, that 100% ownership could in fact be uh, available. This committee report that we have today, the bill, also creates a new digital category. Finally and clearly, distinguishing between internet business or established enterprises, transacting sales of goods and services through online digital platforms versus internet as a mode of mass media, which is completely prohibited um, as uh, foreign owned under not only the Constitution, but reiterated time and time again in other laws. Indeed, much research and study is needed to regulate technology and manage what has become a worldwide backlash, as it were, against the abuse and exploitation engendered by online users. Even as digital commerce, content producers, as well as what DOJ calls the Internet Access Provider, uh, operate within clouds of confusion, unable to point the way forward for Philippine digital development. There is also, in this Foreign Investments Act, this new draft, a whole new area to do with punishment, with sanctions, administrative, and criminal, punishing public officials, employees, as well as foreigners, committing malfeasance, misfeasance, and nonfeasance in the pursuit of foreign investment. Corruption has been a long-standing and pervasive deterrent to investing, not only in the Philippines, but even in Asia. And through much harsher penalties, we hope that like Indonesia, we will finally be able to assure reliability, predictability, and transparency to all those who seek to invest in the Philippines. Finally, it should be noted that this is merely the first step in a long journey to liberalization and genuine competitiveness. Converting the Philippines into a preferred investment destination will require that we also change the Retail Trade Act, the Public Services Act, and uh, many, many other concerns that today fall under um, review. Government procurement, the Contractors Licensing Act, the uh, piece of work limitation to only local contractors are all issues that uh, we have to confront today. So this is a mere first step in a long journey, but certainly if economics defines investment as payment or sacrifice today for a belief in tomorrow, it is important that we bring forward foreign direct investment as a commitment to the future of Philippine trade and the Philippine economy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Marcus. I'm sure there are uh, many, many um, questions for you. Our next uh, speaker will be um, former Secretary Greg um, Domingo. Uh, uh, Greg Domingo is a senior advisor now with the SM Group focused on uh, digital economy and innovation. Um, he has served as uh, Secretary of Trade and Industry as well as being the, the head of the uh, Board of Investments, uh, interestingly. Um, he chaired the APEC Trade Ministers meeting during the Philippine hosting of APEC in 2015. And it was during this time that he championed for export opportunities for micro and small and medium enterprises. I wanted to, to update you on this and let you know that this has become a regular focus for APEC uh, and is a key focus for its work program and is now the subject of a, a WTO work program. So we really, really owe you a great deal for your your passion for this means and that, and, and that has really become something that everyone has taken up. So, really, congratulations um, for that. Thank you very much for coming for it. So, without um, what he has a long resume, I want to know you all. Please welcome Secretary Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Sekmon Lopez. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, forum. Uh, and uh, I'd like to also thank Senator Andy Marcos and fellow panelists that are also with me. Thank you, Ben, for the nice introduction. Uh, also, like to greet uh, the ex Your Excellencies uh, as well as the BIPR. Uh, the workhorse of trade negotiations for the Philippines. Uh, yeah, looking at the presentations of uh, Juan Lopez and Jose Perry, uh, I, I was awed actually, and it gives the impression that the Philippines is in very good hands in terms of its industry development and trade policy and the combination of the leadership of Juan and you said that in the IPR people and of course the POI. Okay, I guess we are here today uh, because of the... How do I change the slides here? Uh, because of the trade tensions uh, between the U.S. and China, as you know, uh, President Trump has been on, uh, on a spree of uh, trying to protect the U.S. from uh, Chinese imports. Uh, and uh, to date, it's a total of $550 billion worth of imports uh, from China that are or will be affected. Some of them are in place already, and some will be in place uh, in the future that accounts for about a third of Chinese exports to the U.S. And uh, this has attracted so much attention in the media, uh, as uh, Mr. Pedroso was saying earlier, that it's become the forefront of uh, news. And uh, there's been a little bit of uh, uh, back uh, not backtracking, but easing off uh, because uh, some of the things might be delayed. This very recent development in the last two to three weeks, uh, the U.S. may delay the implementation of some, some of the other tariff increases. Okay, so given all this uh, rhetoric, how does this affect the, the Philippines? Well, it's, uh, it's very early to tell because it just happened and uh, we haven't seen yet uh, the numbers on the trade side, at least not in enough period, but they should be coming in by, by next year and we should see uh, the actual effect based on numbers. But anecdotal evidence suggests that uh, Philippines will be a uh, net beneficiary of this development as uh, production from China by uh, those who foreign investors who invested in China in manufacturing facilities as well as the Chinese companies manufacturing there we're already seeing some movement south uh, uh, primarily to Vietnam but we're getting a fair share of uh, that movement I sit on the board of one of those Taiwanese companies that you said very very us on the slides and I, I see the huge increases uh, over the next few years, as a result, uh, partly as a result of this movement itself. Uh, then, what, what can the Philippines do? Well, the, the answer really depends on one's view of the world, whether we're free traders or we're protectionists. And I will go through some of the, 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 those slides. Uh, okay. Let me start by just uh, showing you a chart of the global merchandise exports from 1960 to 2018, okay? It's based on uh, World Bank numbers. And just to give you a perspective, uh, we start with uh, GAAP, the General, General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, tariffs and Trade, uh, from which was established in 1947. That was the first attempt of the world to come up with some trade agreements to make it more liberal, to have more free trade. And uh, there, there was an attempt to do that, and it lasted for about 50 years. And when, it, when uh, global trade was starting to take off, when the tariffs became lower, uh, WTO established, because they felt that CAT wasn't sufficient anymore to handle this growing trade agenda 
and they need to formalize it with a bigger ambition and a bigger body. So WTO was created in 1995. Upon creation of the WTO in 1995, uh, there was exuberance on free trade. And a lot uh, of uh, countries participated in lowering their tariffs aggressively. The Philippines was one of the most aggressive, actually, during that time in the late 90s, where we lowered tariffs significantly and many of our product lines. We were kind of ahead of the curve, uh, so to speak, uh, then. But you can see that from 1995, there is not a leader growth, but uh, an exponential growth of exports globally. Okay. Now, on the Philippines case, okay, so that's global, right? So let's go now to the Philippines. Philippines case, you will see that our exports are, have also grown during, uh, I don't, I didn't get, I wasn't able to get the data before 2009, so I was able to get the data from the idea. Actually. And uh, you can see that the exports for the Philippines is on a uh, very positive curve. And as uh, both uh, Segmon and Segperi mentioned, uh, the imports have been growing faster because of our strong GDP growth. So we've been importing a lot of uh, products. Okay, in terms of uh, merchandise exports by category, you see that the strongest growth on our exports is electronics. That's really provided the upward movement of our exports. And then you also, uh, and then the other categories are uh, slightly increasing or, or flat. On the import side, uh, SEC1 actually discussed this a bit already. Uh, you have uh, strong growth in electronics and that makes sense because when you do electronics exports, a uh, big chunk of that are from imported components, so that will align very closely with our export growth. And then, uh, you said Perry mentioned the strength also in the importation of vehicles, right? Uh, that's the lower part, the green part at the bottom. Uh, so from about $2 billion in 2009, it went up to oh, about $10 billion by 2018, so over 10 year period, uh, quintupling of that number. But you see, basically, that in terms of the the, the imports, they're, they're growing uh, very fast. Uh, and again, that's because of the strong GDP growth. Okay, but this is... Uh, what's uh, a good chart as well, uh, because we combine now the merchandise and the service exports. And that's, that's one thing unique with the Philippines, is that the service exports growth of the Philippines are above global trend. So we have a very strong service export category. And you'll see that the total between merchandise and service exports are very strong. Because if you combine the merchandise exports, which is growing steadily, and then you combine it with the faster growing service exports, then the combination is actually growing. So, okay, has free trade worked? Well, yes, right? Uh, trade grew fast when, when trade was most open. That's, uh, that's what I showed in that global trade. Uh, as a result, economies grew fast. As a result, poverty levels uh, came down. Uh, there, were, there was lower cost of uh, goods to the consumers. And the uh, Philippines was a participant in the benefit. Of course, there's the other side of it. Uh, some people say that free trade hasn't worked. And uh, it doesn't work because industrialized countries, perception that industrialized countries and China disproportionately benefit relative to developing countries. So Philippines was kind of good in terms of the performance from a developing country perspective, but there are many other developing countries, in particular in Africa, etc. 
the Multinational, and then there's a perception as well that multinationals and large companies primarily benefited from free trade. MSMEs, medium, small, and uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises or business presented free trade due to importation of competing products into their markets while export markets were beyond reach. And, uh, See, for, for small enterprises, even though the tariff is zero, it's very hard for them to export their products because of the cumbersome rules and regulations in terms of exporting to another country, well, starting with the cost of handling, to standards, to you know, all these permits that they have to get just to export to another country. Then, so these are what you call non tariff which, from my point of view, is one of the biggest problems really in terms of uh, free trade. So is trade protectionism new, right? There's so much hype now about US being very protective of its markets. Actually it's not new. Ever since trade started centuries ago, there's always been some kind of protectionism. When we had GAP, when we had WTO, there's some kind of protectionism. So it's not new. And these are some of the reasons why you need to protect markets. Set one, uh, actually it went through uh, and most of this already earlier. So you can uh, protect, you need to protect sunrise industries, those that are just starting up. And uh, you know, when you're incubating them, you need to protect them. You need to protect sunset industries, those that are about to, to end, right? You wanna, do a very uh, orderly transition towards that closure. Then you need to protect strategic industries, non-renewable resources, and you have to protect against unfair competition, which is like the dumping. Okay, just to recap. Free trade is generally beneficial. One plus one equals three. We saw that in the global trade uh, search after the WTO's form. But free trade works if there's quid pro quo, right? That means if you're giving up something, you must get back something in return. You, get, you shouldn't be, be just giving someone, uh, some countries access without you getting access back. When I say access, real access. Free trade works if everybody benefits. So again, this uh, the rich and the poor have to benefit. The big and small companies have to benefit. So that's what I was referring to earlier, that the access especially for misfits is it's not there. Even with free trade, there will always be areas to protect. Free trade it's, so generally, when you talk about free trade, it's the people associated with lowering tariffs, right? From 20% to 10%, 20% to 0%. But in many cases, it's not a tariff that's a problem, especially in today's environment where, where tariffs are very low. We have many tariff lines that are 0%. U.S. has many tariff lines at 0%. EU has many tariff lines at 0%. Japan, etc. But when you try to export, okay, they have so many rules and regulations that prevent your products from entering. These are what are called non-tariff barriers. Right? That is really the bigger problem when it comes to free trade. And number six, that's so important, okay? At the end of the day, to benefit from free trade, we must have a world competitive product to sell. What, how, what good will it do us if a country opens access to their markets? Let's say no zero tariff, no NTVs, but if our products are not competitively priced, they're not at the right quality, they don't have the right environmental standard, etc. 
even if those markets are freely open, no one will buy your product. Right? So at the end of the day, as what Seth Moon said earlier, we have to focus on the competitiveness of our products. And really, to to be able to have competitive products, we we need to work on the fundamentals. So, okay, already mentioned protectionism is not new. What is new from at least from the perspective of this U.S. versus China fight, right? Is there will be changes in the supply chain as Chinese products are access tariffs, then the supply chain will flow differently. It will flow to Vietnam, it will flow through Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, etc. So we need to study closely. As the numbers come in, we need to study closely how those flows are changing and we have to take advantage of that based on how we see where we can put ourselves in the field. And uh, you said, uh, Perry mentioned the last touch strategy. That's a really nice strategy, I like it. <laughs> Three, trade policy cannot work itself, by itself, right? Uh, trade policy is not in a vacuum. It's really in the competitiveness environment where we are. So we have to work on the fundamentals. We have to continue to improve education. We have to continue to improve infrastructure. And we have to continue to improve governance. Now, all of this impact the competitiveness of our industries. We have to calibrate our industry policy and trade policy relative to the stage of economic development for a country. As a developing country, many of our products still are not world class in terms of pricing. So we have to take that into context when we open up our markets. So that this is what I referred to earlier as a quid pro quo. So that when we give access, we are also able to get access. We, that's what I mean by true access. When, when they open up their markets, that we're actually able to sell products to, to that market. And uh, we continue, we should continue to protect certain industries to safeguard our adopting measures and other things. And finally, we must continue to fight for export taxes of our business by bringing down the NTPs. And I am very happy to say that all of these things, I am not telling DTI to do this because they're already doing it. <laughs> so it's really important for everyone else outside of DTI. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it, was, it was great to hear from you, to hear from you again. I, I think that. Uh, having, having jumped back into the private sector, it was great to, to hear that, that perspective and that, that line, that, that focus on the competitiveness of our product. That, that's a key thing we need to, to keep on thinking about it. It is the private sector that is doing these things, and we are the facilitators, the governments, the facilitator in that process and having a lot of towards policy in order that is, is, is critical. So, so next, we're going to hear about um, exactly that. We're going to hear about identifying the policy environment for new generation FTAs in the new era of globalization from Ambassador Ron Serene. He is the former chief negotiator from the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. He's a principal from Serene Salmon and Associates. He's the co-founder and principal of Serene Salmon and Associates. He represents major U.S. corporations and trade associations for the U.S. government um, before the U.S. Uh, Congress and on major trade issues. Uh, I hope you enjoy that. Um, he was appointed by President Bush and confirmed by the Senate as Ambassador as the Chief Textile Negotiator for USDR. And I was intrigued to read your bio that you used to work for Fruit of the Loom. So I do know that. Uh, um, 
Mexico Free Trade Agreement, Canada Mexico Free Trade Agreement, either by the end of the year, although that, the deadline is very tight, or by early next year. Um, once that's all done, once all of those things are done, the focus then will be continuing on China. Um, I personally believe the problems between the United States and China are much deeper and more concerning than people realize. I think this is a long-term issue. Um, even if there's a temporary agreement or a phase one agreement, as President Trump says, I don't think that's the end of the story. I think there will be continued, uh, uh, continued tariffs going in place. Um, so that's going to occupy a lot of the Trump administration's time um, in the coming years. But the good news is, the only, in my judgment, the only serious new free trade candidate in the United States has is the Philippines. We've already started the free trade negotiation and finished phase one with Japan. So that was the first new agreement that President Trump launched. The second is the Philippines. Um, we'll see, I'm certainly hopeful, there's no guarantees in life, but I'm certainly hopeful that once Congress passes the UMCA, the administration will be focused on the next step of their agenda, and I believe it should be the Philippines. I think it's long overdue. Tom Kino, the former secretary, can attest to we've been working long and hard trying to convince US policymakers that the U.S. Philippine relationship has underperformed, and now it's time to take it to the next level, and I believe we will. So, um, what's key to this, I'm sorry, I guess I'm ignoring. So, I really have already addressed the issues in the first slide. What's really critical in the U.S. system. Um, and I, I think here, too, is that we have an energized, active, private sector effort to demonstrate to politicians the importance of expanding trade between the United States and Philippines and what's in your economic interest and our economic interest. We've already begun the dialogue with key sectors in the United States. And I can tell you that there is tremendous enthusiasm among large parts of the U.S. agricultural community for a free trade agreement with the Philippines. If you talk to sectors like the U.S. pork producers or soybeans growers, which are all very, very important, they see the Philippines as perhaps the next most important market uh, with, with a country that we do not have a free trade agreement. So, we're working on that process, and I think it's also important for the Philippine private sector to come to the United States when you can. I know you're, you're very, very busy, but I think it's also important for U.S. policymakers, both in Congress and in the administration, to hear your side of the story and the importance of expanding trade um, between the two countries. So that, that, that to me, will, will they invaluable dividends um, if, if you're able to do that. Um, and I would start that process you know, sooner rather than later. Um, you know, I think again, the opportunity is, it's really twofold. Um, I believe because of what's characterized as the U.S.-China trade war, where tariffs are being placed on virtually all products from China, Every single U.S. company I know that has production in China is searching for a new home for that production. Um, they may not move 100% of their production on China, but they're going to move well over 50%. And this is a wide range of industries. So they're going to look to homes to invest that they see as more secure, and homes where they believe there will be free trade between the United States and that country. So, given that I believe the China trade war will go on for a long time, and hopefully with an announcement coming at some point in the near future on a US-Philippine free trade agreement, 
I think the investment opportunity and the interest in investing in the Philippines will tremendously exceed um, what you would expect. And again, you have to put that in the context of the companies that are leaving China today, where, where they're going. They're going, first and foremost, to Vietnam. So Vietnam is getting a tremendous amount of investment. Their exports are growing. But what that means is the U.S.-Vietnam trade deficit is ballooning. In just the first nine months of 2019, the U.S. Vietnam trade deficit has exceeded the trade deficit the entire year of 2018. What that means is once these other things are done, USMCA passes, um, the negotiation with Japan continues, there inevitably will be a focus on Vietnam and potentially initiate 301 actions that have been uh, initiated on um, China. And again, it's not that you know the U.S. and Vietnam are friends; they're a very close military, political ally. But it's just the sense of fairness, and that's the key. I think you know there's a feeling by Ambassador Lighthizer, who I believe is one of the greatest U.S. trade representatives, um, that the system, which the U.S. by the way did agree to has been inherently unfair towards the U.S. because it was negotiated at a time where the U.S. economy was so strong and we really didn't fear, the individual sectors feared free trade, but overall the government did not, and, and, and that's changed. I also believe we are the victim of a flawed agreement to allow China to the WTO. But I can tell you when we were negotiating the creation of the WTO, China very much wanted to be a member. And we, were, we would have welcomed that. We wanted China to be a member. But it was clear to us that China wanted the world to conform to their views of the trade war rules of the game, not conform to the WTO, so we said no. We said we would not be the observer, but we will not reach an agreement with which you will be a founding member. President Clinton gets elected, and this sounds partisan. I'm a Republican. But for whatever reason, we decided to um, negotiate an agreement which had a number of flaws, and, it, and I think it's really been the root to the problems that we um, witnessed today um, with China. Um, I'll skip over this. I mean, GSP has been very important to the Philippines. In fact, working with companies like Lo Tien and the Philippine government, we were able, for the first time since the creation of the U.S. GSP program in 1974, to add a major category of products to the program, which is a category called travel goods. So things like handbags and backpacks are now duty-free from the Philippines into the United States. Um, there's been, because I, I know I think I've reached my time, just flat. Uh, fast forward to this chart that shows the data on imports into the United States. First is footwear exports to the U.S. They are not eligible for GSP and they are not duty free, but yet we're starting to see an increase in imports from the Philippines. And I think there's tremendous opportunity. And if we have a free trade agreement, China has about 90% of the U.S. footwear market. So this will be a tremendous growth opportunity uh, for the Philippines. The second is, if you look at this category of goods called travel goods, um, the Philippines was only granted duty free in 2017. We passed the law in 2015. President Obama granted only duty free to the least developed countries like Cambodia and Burma, etc. But it was the tariff man, President Trump, who in 2017, two months after Bob Lighthizer became USTR, said we're going to extend that duty free to the Philippines and other GSP members, uh, other countries that participate in GSP. So you look at the tremendous growth and investment coming in here in a category of travel goods, where you also share duty free treatment with some of your ASEAN competitors like Indonesia. Thailand, etc. 
If you have a free trade agreement, they will not have duty free in many of the other sectors you win. So again, I think the opportunities are endless. Um, you know, what's at stake in it for the U.S.? Um, autos, I know that you're, you're, you're looking at investigating through the safeguard action um, auto imports into uh, your country. But the U.S. does see, and this is very unusual, I think the Philippines is probably the only market in Asia um, that the U.S. sees the prospect of expanding automobile exports to, uh, to, to your country outside the U.S. That's very unusual. We, we, we press the Koreans, but we've really never seen that materialize. So I've already talked about um, the potential for, for agriculture. I guess I would just end in saying the title is Seizing Opportunities. We really need to seize this opportunity. And I think it's wonderful your government, private sector is with patient with the Trump administration. But I can tell you there's great admiration for what your government is doing in the United States. There are also some critics that we need to be realistic about. But I would just urge everyone to stay steadfast and keep pushing and making the arguments and eventually we'll prevail. Thank you. I know there may be a lot of questions um, around the remark of those three excellent um, presentations, but apart from the distinguished speakers, we are also joined today by discussants who have been asked to provide some commentary uh, today. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, Congressman from South Africa has joined us uh, today in the stuck in government committee hearings, but we do have with us um, Mr. Leandro uh, Bellista. He is the founder and CEO of so, uh, Philippines, uh, which he founded while he was Sydney University, uh, which is uh, a remarkable feat. I guess it's, these are the remarkable millennials that I keep on um, hearing about. It is Southeast Asia's largest and only integrated solar developer, investor, and manufacturer. And in South in 2016, uh, he was recognized by Forbes as one of uh, Southeast Asia's 30 under 30 Asian leaders. So take it away, please. First, I'd like to express our gratitude and honor to be on the stage with some of our heroes, Senator Annie Marcos, uh, former DDI Secretary Rebecca Minko, Minister Ambassador, and Secretary Juan Lopez is also here. Thank you for having us. I'd just like to make a brief statement on why I believe industrialization is the key to developing the Philippine economy. But first, I'd like to just briefly introduce our company. We are the country's largest producer of solar energy with solar farms currently supplying electricity to Morocco at 3 pesos per kilowatt hour, the lowest cost of electricity in the Philippines and half the cost of coal and gas. We believe that renewable energy will greatly contribute to lowering the cost of electricity in the Philippines and increasing our competitiveness as a manufacturing exporter and thank the work of legislators like Senator Marcos for advocating the adoption of renewable energy over the years. Our company also manufactures its own solar panels with around 600 employees in our factory and over a thousand employees across our company, making sure that our panels have as much local content as possible in increasing the multiplier effect of using renewable energy to power the Philippines. And through manufacturing, we experience firsthand how difficult it is to compete with emerging hubs like Vietnam for global exports. One of our customers is a leading Chinese manufacturer that exports to the US through OEM and our factory. And while we do get a good deal of business now that the US has imposed tariffs on Chinese solar panels, incentivizing these manufacturers to come to the Philippines, there is more than 10 times as much volume in Vietnam than in the Philippines in solar panel manufacturing. And we believe that while there's potential, there's still a lot of work to do to maximize the potential for job creation through high-tech manufacturing in the Philippines. But nonetheless, we persist in this because we believe that manufacturing, more than agriculture or services, is the key to creating good-paying jobs for the Filipino people. 
And I just like to um, refer them to what I think is one of the best examples for economic development in the Philippine countryside. And that is what former President Marcos did in Isabel Leite, which was once a rural area, which now has the country's largest smelting plant with uh, a Philippine-associated um, smelting plant, Azar, that smells copper, which I believe comes from Australia, as well as Philippine phosphate, which is the largest producer of fertilizer in the Philippines. So Isabel Leite used to have just agricultural uh, output. But today, because of these two government-driven industrialization projects in the 1980s, it is now the largest taxpayer and largest job generator in the entire Western Desire, of Eastern Desires and one of the largest such contributors to the national economy. Leite was instrumental in bringing this energy-intensive industry to the Philippines because President Marcos saw the opportunity to harness low-cost renewable energy from geothermal plants in the next town of Pananga Leyte decades ago. This was at a time when the Philippines was far less developed than it is today. And if this was made possible in Leyte, I think we should look to examples like this, not like Makati, which is a financial set, a hub that is largely service-oriented and inapplicable to the rest of the country, and ask every province in the Philippines to consider how they can use industrialization, like what President Marcos did in Leyte, to improve the lives of all Filipinos. And we are hopeful that now with Senator Marcos in the Senate, every province in the Philippines will be able to benefit in the same way. So I think the, the general statement is, we can talk about a hundred reasons why the Philippines is not as competitive in manufacturing as countries like Vietnam. But at the end of the day, because of the potential of manufacturing to end poverty, this should be the number one priority for the Philippine government to incentivize. And secondly, that the only reason why this cannot be done is not for any intrinsic reason. Because if it was possible in Leyte, it is possible in the entire country. The only reason then is a lack of political will. And hopefully now we can make this a priority and share the benefits with the rest of the country. Thank you. I'm delighted that you mentioned Leyte because my wife's family um, comes from all of this. So I'm very glad um, that you mentioned that. I'll, I'll, I'll report that um, um, to, to, to her. Um, I, I have a, a, a number of Slido questions, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, there may be some questions around the room. We're open for, for questions from, from the floor. But if you don't have any, I wanted to pick open the Senator Marcos, you, you mentioned the new foreign investment act, and then there's a, there was a question here on one asking you for the chances of getting this new act passed within this within this moment. That's a key one to see. So, to get the board going. Yes, I'm quite certain they'll get through the 18th Congress. We're hopeful that. Um, following the uh, budget for 2020, as well as um, other delayed legislation, such as the CITIRA, the tax, the tax acts, as well as the coconut levy. Um, I think that around about February, we should be ready to discuss it in a more comprehensive um, fashion. And uh, I'm set for the period of interpolation, but that will have to follow with the other priority measures. But the President has repeatedly stated that the Foreign Investment Act, the Retail Trade Act, the uh, Public Services Act, all of these will be uh, um, accomplished from the 18th Congress. These are key to, I think, some of the SDA deals on the way. Well, as uh, Secretary Moore 
said uh, in the slides, right, that uh, the foundation of trade policy is the investment policy. So they go hand in hand. So definitely uh, what uh, Senator Ali is uh, working on in terms of the foreign investments act and we bring coming up with a new version of the investments act is critical, it's very crucial to also the the trade policy in terms of promoting the country as a manufacturing or service export destination. Uh, Thank you. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to keep my eye on the room for Yes, sir. Uh, could I could I get a microphone to the gentleman at the front, please?
like to ask whether if you uh, meant uh, a more activist industrial policy, uh, what sort of criteria would you suggest for governments to back uh, what can be considered industrial winners? And, uh, and uh, is there a timeline to vote? Uh, what sort of measures or indicators might be ideal to monitor in order to find out whether we are evolving in terms of our current level of development, which calls for another set of trade policy. So if you could please elaborate so it would be very uh, very good. Thank you. Yeah, what I meant by that is uh, for example, if uh, if we were a highly industrialized country and we produce a lot of competitive products, then we should really aspire to have as many uh, free trade trade agreements as possible uh, so that we can sell our products because by definition our products should be very competitive. But given that uh, we're still a middle-income country and uh, going forward towards our industrialization path, uh, we have to choose where we think we have an advantage uh, and then what what measures would you look at there? It's it's really you have to benchmark uh, certain industries and certain maybe products and services uh, relative to world standards and see where we can be competitive. Then those are the areas where we have to aspire to get access to our trade partners and. To get access, we will have to give up something in return. Not necessarily in that same industry, but maybe in another industry where they want to gain access to our markets. And then, so for the inbound part, we need to make an assessment as well of whether these things that we'll give, our, whether our industries are mature enough to be able to compete with this incoming uh, sectors. So so you have to assess the outbound, see whether your markets are going to be competitive outside, and you have to make an assessment of the inbound to see whether your industries are competitive for the products that will be coming in. And DTI already does uh, that analysis, so yeah, and that's how they actually decide on on how to negotiate this uh, trade agreements. Mr. the least, if I, if I may, um, do, do you use the free trade agreements in, in your business? Do, do, would you know? As an OEM manufacturer, the customer is the one that handles the exports, but to the extent that the U.S. has imposed tariffs on China and has excluded the Philippines, we are thankful for the preferential trade access for that. I mean, where do you source the materials for the real sales so panels? Would you know, do you have to have a sense of your... We have most of our material from China. From China, so, so do you use that as the end China FTA for that? Yes. And do you, do you benefit from that? Yes, but it's not a comparative advantage over other countries, because I think all of the alternative destinations also benefit from that. So if, 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 if the Philippines was going to have a market, we saw that list from Secretary Lopez, are there other markets you'd like the Philippines to be embarking on FTA negotiations? Well, give me three from your perspective. I, I think that in the solar industry at least, the Philippines is at a competitive position as far as market access. It's more of just a competitiveness of manufacturing in this country that we all face. So what, 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 but if they were going to negotiate three FTAs, what would you say? Three markets you think you would have to be from an export perspective? As far as solar is concerned, I think we already have preferential market access to all major solar markets. So we thank the DPI for its order that. This is Tom. I'd like to open this question at the last question. Ron, do you find that experience uh, going through the rounds of the halls of the US Congress? The US Senate and the world of the FDAs. Without getting too much into the understanding of the US, specifically 
an issue like uh, human rights in the Philippines. How much of a level of standpoint can you would, would impose in concluding the FDA, considering that uh, you know, as chief negotiator, you get hit by all kinds of known uh, issues, unknown issues, toward the last minute of the uh, assignment. Any thoughts to what extent is that a burden for us? So I think your question is essentially, will the human concern expressed by some in the U.S. on human rights be a barrier to the negotiation of free trade agreement? Um, the simple answer is in the end of the day, no. But that doesn't mean we cannot take those accusations seriously and respond to them. I think at the end of the day, what's going to drive whether this agreement is successful and passes the U.S. Congress is the economic content of it. Is it fair? Is it balanced? Is there opportunity for U.S. industry? Um, and what will be the impact of increased imports from the Philippines? And I think if you look at all those issues, there's really going to be very little controversy <clears throat> on the economic front. Um, there, you know, it's, it's very interesting. U.S. politics is maybe not that different than Philippine politics. Anything President Trump likes, Democrats tend to hate, and vice versa. But the thing that just tickles me to death is prior to the election of Donald Trump, you could not go into a Democratic Congressional office and, and hear anything other than NAFTA is the worst trade agreement in the history of mankind. Donald Trump gets elected. He basically says that about NAFTA, and all of a sudden Democrats love NAFTA. So if they announce the initiation of free trade agreements with the Philippines, there will be some that will be <coughs> who will want to emphasize that. And they're going to just going to say, you know, we've got this strong man, Donald Trump, negotiating an agreement with another strong man, President Duterte. But I think, again, at the end of the day, people realize an agreement will transcend the current presidents. An agreement will transcend um, what is seen as kind of the petty um, issues of the day. So I think it's manageable. I don't think we take it for granted. But if I might just have a second go back to one of the central questions in, in, about how does, how does the Philippines move forward with this free trade negotiation? To me, it seems to be important, and this is unsolicited advice, unsolicited advice, but as we move forward in negotiations to do some soul searching about what policies here in the Philippines are necessary to change so that you are competitive and the shining example of the world in the next 10 years. We were in a session on Monday, and I heard a lot of people say, you know, 30 years ago, the Philippines was the largest, most successful economy in Asia, and now we're number five. And one thing that really struck me, we had the honor of representing and advising a country in Asia, I guess, I probably should mention their name, but they're divided between North and South and they're Japan. And they, we went there when we started our advising of uh, that government, and we heard a lot about, we're in this agreement to get the U.S. to eliminate their auto tariffs, get the U.S. to eliminate that. So we left and we went and met with the trade minister and high-level political appointees, and, and he, they said to us, and I shouldn't have been surprised, but they said to us, that's not unimportant. But I want this agreement because we have really stupid laws in our country. We need to reform. If we're going to compete with China, if we're going to compete with Japan in the 21st century, we have to reform our own economy. And we see a U.S. free trade agreement as um, a way to accomplish that. So I think that's maybe food for thought in terms of should these negotiations continue, what else do you need to do to make sure you're attracting the investment? Because there's a lot of competition for investment. Um, just two points. The first point has to do with branding of our exports. 
Nowadays, 50 years, the Philippines is exporting its cheap labor. But we never thought of branding our products or services we export. I think we have forgotten that whoever owns the brand owns the market. Why is there mango and sour in Spain in the Philippines? But I don't see Cinderella or French in Spain. We have forgotten the importance of brand marketing. I am glad that Solar Philippines is using Solar Philippines. I hope you brand your products. Maybe call it Solar Fill and export it globally with a Philippine branded item. Do not just be a cheap labor supplier of a foreign brand. I wonder what the thoughts of the gentleman are. That's one point. The second point is capital formation. We back in 2000 in the Philippine Stock Exchange, we made a research on how many Filipinos own shares in companies. The number was 1%. So only 1% of Filipinos think as a capitalist. 99% think of themselves as a labor. That's probably why we exported labor. We compared that number with the U.S. and we discovered in the U.S. 60% of Americans own capital, either directly through the stock exchange or through a mutual fund. That said, shall the Philippines develop a mechanism where we can get capital formation from Filipinos, whether you are poor, middle, or or rich people, but how can you get this, this fund together that can be invested in critical industries that are owned by Filipinos or should be owned by Filipinos, like solar Philippines, for example, and not depend on 100% foreign capital, which China has sold by their state capitalism. So you have state capitalism on one side, multinational capitalism on the other side, and the Filipinos left with nothing. Meaning, eventually, Filipinos in their own country will become workers of foreign own companies. So this is a concern that maybe we should start looking how do we get capital from more Filipinos to be substantial enough to compete with foreign capital, even as we get by foreign capital into the country. I think we have to make that um, the last uh, question. So there was a question, I think, on, on brand Philippines. I think that the, something to sort of add on to that, if, if, if I may, is, is an interesting phenomenon that we're seeing in, in, in some of the overseas investments from the Philippine corporate sector. Maybe this is a question I might have to, 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 to you, Brenda. We've seen Johnny B buying to smash burger and to, to buy a what else did they look at? That's right. So, so, so maybe the Philippines is beginning to get known through these through these brands. That something that's happening. What, what does that mean for us? And what does that mean for the trade policy strategy and then ownership? I guess that's that's the bigger question. How do we do that? I mean, I I guess as as, as one of the overseas Filipino workers, I I try by and then I pick up a few uh, um, uh, shares now and then when I get a few tips. But uh, what are the mechanisms that we have? We have the public funds and so on. What else is there? So that, that those are sort of two elements of the, of the question. So let's throw it over to the whole panel. I'm going to pick up the corporate one and take a set of Would you like to pick up on some of those? You want the bills for work on you? So I'll let you talk about it. Um, I'm not certain this is responsive to the branding, but the, in another life, I interfaced with the DTI um, as a film and game developer in the digital space. So that's what I do, sideline the book. And the thing I to do is the contention amongst us has always been that um, we need to level up the entire industry, the entire creative industry, so that we are not mere suppliers of labor, of services, and uh, continue to uh, be the cheap labor for uh, everyone, from Disneyland to Toei in Japan and so on, but instead begin to tell our stories 
and generate creative content, original IP. That's really the goal. Um, I think that this goes not only for the digital sector or the game and film sector, but more importantly for the entire uh, Philippine economy. For example, um, with DTI, I've always maintained that we should wind down the cycle effort to keep selling product. We aren't able to manufacture at the rate uh, we are going as um, our capabilities are still highly suspect. However, what is indubitable is Filipino talent. We should market our designers, our game developers, our film directors, because they are world class. The talent, no doubt, is world class. I really think that Creative Philippines is a brand that will sell overseas very, very well. Not product, but talent. Well, on, on, uh, on the branding side, uh, I mean, I'll just share my opinion, but uh, I'm not really uh, an expert on this. But my view is, like, on the branding side, is uh, the, the mindset of the Filipino as well the, as the access of the Filipino businessmen to that global network of IP is still lacking. Uh, are a lot of the local business people aspirations except for you are still uh, domestic. Uh, and except for a few ones like the model is bought the more the USA and we have uh 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 and by White and McKay and also the picnic brand long time ago. So picnic is all by the picnic company, picnic. No? And and like Jollibee, uh, uh, Jollibee is the best example because of the retail network of Jollibee. Uh, they have a lot of branches now overseas and very successful. Uh, you have the likes of Carlos Chan, the OHC. So yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the issue, right? We go to many Asian countries, and of course China is very big there, South Africa is factories, uh, and very, very successful. Uh, I went to one of these countries that they did Myanmar, and I saw the Russian part. And I was so proud, because it's a Philippine country, so I go to the, to the person, the local person there, and I the shop, and he's like, pointing to me. Oh, you know this Philippine <laughs> No, no, it's Japanese. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, I guess, the, the way they think, right? But anyway, so, but we need, uh, I, I'm not sure why the Filipino businessman is still uh, domestic looking. Okay, maybe one explanation is there's still so much opportunity uh, here domestically that they want to redeploy their capital here. Uh, and, and I know that I'm with SM, right? Uh, I'm associated with SM, so they have big operations, uh, not big, but they have significant operations in China, relative to their size here. Uh, but uh, the, the needs here domestically, in terms of investment, uh, uh, all the, the capital that's generated out of the business here can be redeployed fully in the Philippines. So that's why uh, the looking outward uh, to deploy capital is not very strong on the mindset because there's enough opportunities to this. Okay, I'm, I'm told that it's, it's time to wrap it up. So. Um, I'm sorry, we, 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 could, we could go on for a long time, but please join me in thanking our panel for a very rich and dynamic conversation. Thank you very much. So again, thank you very much to our panel for session two on the Senator Marcus.
um, former Secretary Domingo and former Ambassador Serini, and of course our discussion, Mr. Viste, and thank you as well to um, Mr. Ed Pedrosa for steering the discussions in session two. Um, we now break for lunch. So we would like to call the Secretary of State.